skip it all, but all right, very good. Just take the word of God, please, and turn to the 17th chapter of John as we'll finish this up uh, today. Jesus has prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples and the work that must be done. And he has prayed for them not to escape the world they're in, but to give them the strength and courage and encouragement and the power that lies in the spirit they will receive. Not in their circumstances or finances or relationship, but in the Lord. We can see in this last portion of this high priestly prayer, he's now placing the emphasis of praying for those that will be reached. And the overarching theme of this last portion of the 17th chapter of John is that of unity. If we look in verse 20 through 26, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with, uh, I'm sorry, give me, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. There is this sense of unity that Jesus is praying for, this intimacy, knowing that what's going to happen in years to come there is going to be attack against the unity of God's work, God's word. Uh, we can see that today in the multitude of religions and Bibles and translations and arguments against things like that. When the goal is to give out the gospel and to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing that unity is our greatest strength, if we would all strive together, as the Bible says, imagine what our church could do in this community if we were all of one accord. Imagine with a, a good Bible-believing preach, a preaching church just 20 minutes up the road and, and another one 45 minutes up the road and uh, others spread out the, throughout the, the area here. If we were all in one accord, <laughs> what we could do for the cause of Christ. This is not a cry for ecumenicalism. It is a cry for unity of biblical Christianity. There was a story told of two men riding a tandem bike up a steep hill. After much effort, they finally made it to the top. And the front rider said, that was a rough ride. To which the rider in Brack said, you're right. Had I not held the brake, we could have slipped backwards. In other words, there was a whole lot more effort than should have been placed in it if the guy in the back would have been pedaling instead of holding the brake. Oftentimes we keep the work of God from moving forward because of the fear of what could happen instead of pressing forward. And Jesus, with the knowledge that he had and all-knowing, knew that unity, or disunity rather, would be the destruction of God's work. We see that very clearly seen in Joshua 22, uh, the destruction of disunity that is there. Jesus understood that the future believers would have a different struggle than that of the men that he had just spent the last three years with. Uh, these men had a common leader who's physically with them. Uh, they were of the same area and things of that nature. And now we are spread across the culture of the lands and a different time uh, and things change. And I don't know about you, but things have changed since I have even grown up. And there is more, uh, there is a greater struggle to maintain a sense of biblical unity than ever before. Now, I will say that there are many different variables and there are many different struggles 
But you and I can have great unity and great power and great success serving the Lord because of the promise that God has given to us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that means the emotional needs we have in 2023, God can meet. The physical needs we have in 2023, God can meet. The mental needs we have in 2023, God can meet. The financial needs we have in 2023, God can meet. He has promised that he would supply all of our need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Please don't confuse your wants with your needs. But he said he would supply all of those things. It takes God's people getting on their knees, getting in their Bible, getting in their church, getting in their community, and getting involved. We're supposed to work and labor, labor for the Lord. And this is what the prayer is about. He's praying for those that would be reached, that there would be unity, and thus the strength of following the Lord. God will supply the last moments on earth that we are on his mind. Think about that. In his last moments before he's going to give his life and when he was at Calvary, we were on his mind. Uh, you ever heard that song? Uh, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. It's tough for me to think about that. Because you know, when, when I'm in agony and I'm suffering and I'm hurting, do you know who I think about? <coughs> me. <laughs> That's who I think about. Or I think about my family. I think about my circumstances. I think how all of this will affect me. And Jesus, in his greatest physical agony and greatest physical suffering and greatest amount of sorrow and torture, was thinking about us. I want you to know today that you and I are the reason Jesus came. So it's no wonder that we consumed his mind and his heart and his actions, and his life. We know there is this great truth that he gave his life for mine. Jesus confirms that his thoughts and concerns are not just for the present hour in verse number 20. Neither, he says, neither pray I for these alone, the, the disciples that he's working with physically in that moment. But he says, but for them also which shall believe on me, through their word. In other words, them giving out the gospel and the people, the future Christianity, just like this morning we learned about in Sunday school, he talked about he would make this, this covenant and the bow in the sky would be a perpetual covenant for generations to come. And that would include us. Amen. And so here he says that, that I'm not just praying for the disciples that are here physically now, but I'm praying for those people that will get saved and those that will that carry the gospel message to a lost and dying world. If you are here today and you are saved and born again, it is your ministry to give the gospel to a lost and dying world. Now, how the, what that means in the sense of the depth of it, I'm not saying that God is calling you to full-time ministry or to become a missionary or to work full-time at a church. What I'm saying is that every single believer... Jesus prayed that you would have the strength and wisdom and power to give the gospel to a lost and dying world. Why? Because there is a generation to come. Can I say that we should not be so consumed with the present age, but rather keep our eyes fixed on the future? We just had a whole host of young people go back in the back. Young people, and they're going to learn about Jesus now. Because they're going to tell their friends. I had a young lady come up to me, a young junior age lady, and said, Pastor, where can I get some more tracks at so I can pass some tracks out to my friends? That's encouraging to hear. Amen. That's encouraging. Matter of fact, it sparked in my mind to think, man, our tracks are so old, and we have just now working on, and Julia's working on some new tracks for us, and we already have, I think, three already ready to go, getting ready to head out to be printed, something that's updated and ready to go, some for young kids and some for uh, when you go out to eat and some for just regular things that you can invite people to church and give them the gospel and share the gospel and also share your church with them. It's our obligation. Go with me to the 78th Psalm. 78th Psalm. We're going to look at the first eight verses. And with our hearts fixed upon future, 
we're reminded in uh, Psalm 78 that there is a generation to come. And there are children that need to hear the gospel that have not yet been born yet. Who's going to tell them about the gospel? In Psalm 78, it says, Give ear, O my people, listen up. And this scripture was written for even people like me. It said, give ear. I've only got one that works. So give ear. I'll give you my good ear. Listen up. Pay attention. This is important. This is vital. To my law, incline your ear to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them, to their children. So he says, and don't just listen to it, but follow them, heed them enough to when your children have children, they can tell their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Oh, would it not be said about our generation that we had, did not train our children and teach our children and study ourselves and have a faith ourselves to where they say, oh, I hope we're not like our father. Oh, that, that is a heartbreaking thought to me that my children or any young person that's come through here would say, I hope I do not end up like Pastor Rich. I hope I have a serious Love for Christ. I don't want what he has. I want something real. And that should break your heart if your children ever think your Christian life is fake. Yeah. It should break your heart to think if another adult would think that your life is fake. I want my life to be real and authentic. Listen, you may not like me, but what you see is what you get. Amen goes right there. Hallelujah. Okay? Amen. Jesus understood the importance of teaching the next generation and the danger of what could happen if we don't. I want to tell you today that mediocre, lukewarm Christianity is destroying a biblical foundation. And we knew it was going to happen. The Bible says the evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. I think the greatest seduction that's happening is the party for Jesus movement that says, do what you want, do how you want it, and you can still love God. That's not what my Bible says. And my Bible says that God loves you and God is gracious but the Bible also says, shall I continue, continue in sin that grace shall abound? God forbid. God loves you. Just like a parent loves their child, but they're only going to put up with the same action over and over and over again before they step in and chasten you in whatever way. God is gracious, but God is also righteous and just. Many of you are praying for your children and their generation to come. Keep after it. But don't just pray for them. Live for Christ. Speak of Christ. Love Christ. There is a chorus. I don't know if they still do it anymore, but there was a chorus that used to open up the services with at Crown College when I was there. And it comes from Psalm 103, verse 1. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It was a great chorus to start the, the service off with. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Do they still do that or not? It's a different one now. They've changed it. Young guys are like, <laughs> yeah, they did it all the time. Loved it. I won't continue singing because it gets real high and I just don't, and says, you know, the struggle's real sometimes. But let's look, look finally here. Jesus prays for all believers. What does he pray for them for? Number one, to be evangelized, to be evangelized. He says in verse number 20, uh, no, I better get back out of Psalm. That's definitely not what's going to work there for me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So without saying it, he's implying that there's going to be further work to be done. That means that he says these guys are going to go out and they're going to give the gospel. They are going to share their faith. 
Oh, when we come to church here, the assumption is that I am taking the week and two weeks and however long it is. Uh, in my phone, I've got a whole list of messages. As soon as the Lord lets me preach them, I, I'm, I'm ready to go on it, right? Uh, you study, you pray about these things. I'm preparing a meal, and the assumption is that the meal is going to feed you to do what God has called every person to do. And you're not going to be like some of those kids that come up and go, mm, I don't want that. Mm, I don't like that. Listen, I didn't get this way, this size by saying no to food, amen? Uh, but I'm telling you, we cannot be like that. Listen, it is not Burger King, uh, Baptist Burger King where you can have it your way. You take the truth of God's word. It's not a buffet where you can say, I want some of that. I want some of that. I don't like that. I don't like that. It doesn't matter what you and I like. We have to take God at his full word. Why? Because there is a world out there that needs to be evangelized. They need the word of God Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus has commissioned these men to reach the world and they will make a drastic impact upon the world. What changed in them? These men that ran from, from being associated with Jesus, what changed in their life? The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changed their life. These men that were cowards and were running away and even associate and even denied his name, some even cussing about not even knowing him. What changed? The miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ changed their life and they became bold. So bold, the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 and verse number six, and when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, preaching about the mighty King of kings and Lord of lords, turn this world upside down. And why do we do this? We do this so that people might know about the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about the overall theme at the very beginning last year when he started preaching about out of the book of John. And we said the overall theme could be found at the end of the book. But in John chapter 20, verse 21 through 23, it says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, Whosoever sin you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sin you retain, they are retained. We have here the message of the gospel. I'm sending you out in the power of the Holy Ghost. You're going to go out that all the earth may know about the Lord Jesus Christ. D.L. Moody was once confronted with, by a man who opposed the way that he gave the gospel to people. The way he evangelized. Don't you love people when they give your opinion on how you're doing something? That's a blessing, isn't it? I told with Sam, he said something. I said, I love your Cleveland sarcasm. He goes, I love your Norwalk sarcasm. <laughs> we have a little bit of sarcasm here. This was his reply. D.L. Moody replied to the gentleman like this. I agree with you. I don't like the way I do it either. Tell me, how do you do it? The lady replied, I don't do it. Moody responded, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. In other words, sometimes people are very critical about the things that we're doing and they're not doing it themselves. Can I tell you some of my best ideas come at the end of the project <laughs> when it's too late? And there are lots of people that have that. You know what you should have done, preacher? <laughs> you know what we should have had? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where were you a month ago? <laughs> but there's an understanding that the gospel is to be given out. Uh, some may say, well, well I'm not D.L. Moody. And that's okay. Hudson Taylor said this, God is not looking for men of great faith. He's looking for common men to trust his great faithfulness. In other words, let God use you. True evangelism is done in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we must be men and women who will follow that leading. As God says, go, go. May God give us the strength to evangelize this in this wicked world. It is possible uh, because God gives us opportunities every day to witness to this lost and dying world. Jesus displays the confidence of that evangelism in verse 20 when he says, those that shall believe on me through their word. Uh, not through them convincing, but through them speaking the word of God, being faithful to the word of God. Honestly, living a life changed by the word of God. I'm telling you, our, our personal testimony, your personal testimony will catch more people's attention than anything else. Why? Because it's real in your life. God has changed. When you can say, hey, God can change your life, but nothing's different about your life, it doesn't carry much weight. 
Uh, but when you come up to somebody and you say, God can change your life, and I've talked to a lot of people that I went to high school with, and I say, hey, God can change your life, they listened. You know why? Because they knew who I used to be in high school, amen? They had a real clear and good picture of how I used to be. God has changed who I am. So he, he uh, prays for them to be evangelized. But then he prays for them to be unified. Look at verse 21 through 23. It says that they all may be one, be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I will say this. His prayer was for unity. And I want to say that disunity in the church should be impossible. Did you hear me? Disunity in the church should be impossible. Do you know why? Because if you're saved and born again, you have the same spirit inside of you that I have. Right. Hello. Yep. You have, if you're using your Bible, then you have the same message I have. Right. And if you've got the same spirit and the same message, then we should have the same end goal, which is found in 1 Corinthians you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So why is there disunity? If we have the same spirit, we have the same message, and the same goal, where does the disunity come from? But Jesus understood that disunity was going to come. You know why? Because you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner. And we know, and even Paul talks about that. He says, are you yet carnal? He had to deal with carnality in the church. We deal with carnality in the church today. We deal with pragmatism in the church today. If it works, do it. If it doesn't work, don't do it. That is not spirit-led. The spirit-led life is a faith life. But disunity should truly be impossible in the church. A Puritan preacher by the name of Thomas Brooks wrote this, Discord and division become no Christian. For wolves to worry the lambs is no wonder. But for one lamb to worry another lamb, this is unnatural and monstrous. It's one thing for somebody who is a wolf in sheep's clothing to disturb the flock. But for another lamb to disturb another lamb, it's unnatural. There should be nothing but unity here. Now, unity does not mean uniformity, all right? We don't all walk in the back of the church. We're all wearing a black, a gray suit, whatever color this is, with a red tie and black shoes. Uh, we don't all walk in at the same time and then sit down. And you say something good. Everybody on the count of three says, amen. Amen. And then we get up and we leave. No, that's not, unity is not uniformity. It says, hey, Keith is different from me but we have the same spirit. Dave is different than me, but we have the same spirit. Danny is different than me, but we have the same spirit. And so our diversities can bring about unity Amen. to glorify God. Yeah. So his prayers for unification. It's interesting. Look at the goal of unity that Jesus sets in verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now think about that. Having the same depth of unity that God the Father and God the Son have. As you and I, Father, are one, may they be one with us. I'd say that's a pretty high goal. So it takes a surrender to self, a diving in depth to the word of God, a complete abandonment to the Lord. But it's possible. We've seen mighty men used of God, and it wasn't because of them. It's because they committed themselves wholeheartedly to God. This means our life must be divinely ordered. Hudson Taylor said this, do not have your concert first and then tune your instrument afterwards. Begin the day with the word of God and prayer and get first of all into harmony with him. 
Could you imagine if these fellows wouldn't have practiced this morning, wouldn't have got the mics tuned in or anything like that? It would have been a train wreck for everybody here. Why? Because not because of them. We got to get our speakers dialed in, the microphones dialed in, making sure everybody blends well together. That has to be done ahead of time. You can't just walk in and be like, ah, we'll wing it. And sometimes it works, I guess. But for the most part, it doesn't work that way. Listen, I'm a, I'm a wing it kind of guy on some things. About other things, I don't want to wing it on, all right? So he says, get yourself in tune. Be able to be in tune with man. We must first be in tune with God, first and foremost. Why? Because people get on your nerves. Hello. You know how I know that? Because I've gotten some of your nerves. <laughs> yeah, I know that, for sure. So we must be in tune with God to be able to deal with some things. I see this in 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. In other words, it gives us the ability to forgive people. Now, we're not talking about wiping things out of the rug. We're talking about forgiving things and moving forward. Charity covers a multitude of sins. This means there is life there is a life of submission. And Jesus has always been submissive to the Father. And so we ought to always be submissive to God. So we see here that they're looking for people to be evangelized, for believers to be unified, but also for God to be glorified. For God to be glorified. How is he glorified? He's glorified by walking in the power of the Spirit. Only the Spirit of God can take people from all different walks of life and stages of life and bring about unity. Somebody who is a mechanic and doesn't like the outdoors can get along with somebody who's all about the outdoors. Somebody who's a city folk can get along with somebody who's into farming and agriculture and permaculture. Somebody that can't stand animals can love a pet lover. Why? Because the Spirit of God can unite them and bring them together. I think now of some people, even in this room, that without the Holy Spirit, without God, I don't know what I would do. I, like, I don't know what conversation we would have. What would we talk about? But because of the Spirit of God, we automatically have one thing already right off of the bat. And by us having unity in that, in the power of the Spirit, brings about glory to God. That all these people, all of us can get here together and we can sing the wonderful praises of God and that glorifies God. All of our different walks of life can glorify God but by being spirit-filled. This is miraculous work of God. And when this happens, it displays the power of God to a lost and dying world. So not only in the power of the Spirit, but God can be glorified in the presence of the Lord. Look at verse number 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. God will be glorified not only in this life as we walk in the power of the Spirit and the presence of the Spirit and consciously walking with eternity in mind, but God will be glorified in the presence of the Lord. There's a song um, by the Inspirations that says, I've made it, thank God I've made it. My feet have touched the peaceful shore. What glory and honor would it bring to God for each person to step into heaven who trusted and took God at his word? To say, God, I trusted you more than even what I think my mind could comprehend. I trusted you and believed you and followed you with my whole life, not just my lips. I didn't just give you service. I didn't have a religion. I trusted you. And that glorifies God. He says, I want them to be with me. The great victory for the believer is to see Jesus face to face. Listen now. Man, that'll make a dead Presbyterian shout right there. Now listen, face to face to see the Lord. Think about that. Fanny Crosby said, they asked her one time, if you could ever get your vision back, would you do it without hesitation? She said, no, because the first thing I want these eyes to behold is the face of my Savior. Man, that's amazing. To think that we would not be able to enjoy the beauty of this world. But to know the first thing I would see is the Savior who loved me and gave his life for me. And for my eyes to behold perfect beauty in heaven. Mm, that's some good stuff right there. Great victory. The picture 
uh, this, uh, the picture of his suffering has filled our mind here on earth. You think about that as you read it and you, your mind gets consumed with the suffering and your mind is filled with uh, the teachings that he said, but one day we will behold him face to face. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do when we see him face to face? Well, I think, I really believe that we're going to end up kind of like John did in Revelation chapter number one. Go with me to Revelation chapter number one. I love this description of John when he sees the Lord. In, John, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I believe when we see him face to face, this will call us, cause us to fall at his feet and cry, worthy is the lamb. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, it says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now think about that. Imagine seeing the one who gave his life for you and falling unworthily before him. And he says, fear not. Oh, what a great day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Amen. So there will be that being in the presence of the Lord will glorify him. However, we're not called to wait until that day to live in the conscious presence of the Lord, are we? No, we're not. We're called to live in the conscious presence of the Lord now, today, in this moment. Our church services would be so much more alive if people lived in the conscious presence of the Lord at all times. Because every time you heard the word of God spoke and preached and taught and even read, you would say, amen, that's for me. Amen, that's for me. Every time. But how can we have the presence of God in this physical world? Number one, through knowledge. Through knowledge. I want you to go with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And look at verses 2 through 4. Through knowledge, we can have the presence of God. In 2 Peter chapter number 1, starting in verse number 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We can have the presence of God in our life by the knowledge of God, knowing him. How do I know him? Open up the word of God. Read about him. And the more you know about him, the truth that you've seen in his word, it allows the presence of God to reign in your life truly, freely, and fully by knowing what his word has said. Notice grace and peace are multiplied. It says in the very beginning of that verse, the more I know about God, the more I can see what he has done for me and for all Believers, there comes a peace in knowing that God will complete the work he has started and I can trust him for all things. It reminds me of a story of a father and a son who went out fishing together and they wanted to go fishing in this one river. They had been there multiple times and it was actually one of their favorite things to do and they were fishing and they got so caught up in fishing and trying to get the fish in, they weren't paying attention as good as they should have been. And the current started to pick up a little bit. And by the time the father knew what was going on, they were already caught in some, some rapids. And they had ended up hitting a rock, which tipped the boat enough to make his son fall over the edge. And the son had gotten caught in the rocks below. And he could see his father, but he could not get out. And at first, he's like, the dad's worried. He thinks his son's going to start freaking out. And he just looks at him and says, stay calm. Your daddy's got you. And his father ends up reaching down and he ends up getting him free and getting him out of the water and he made it and they get home and they tell their story. And, and the first question they asked was how in the world, to the son, how in the world did you stay so calm when you were literally dying? And the boy said this. He said, all I knew is I could see my father and he promised that he would rescue me and I just trusted him. He stayed calm. He had his eyes fixed upon the father. And he knew his dad would keep his promise. 
I want you to know that no matter how tumultuous this world gets, no matter how troublesome this world gets, you can trust your Father. He has your best interests at heart. And we can know and live in the conscious presence of the Lord through knowledge, but also through the Holy Ghost. Go with me to Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17. The great promise that has been given to us is that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Because when we're fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, we're not walking in the presence of God. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You and I have the opportunity to walk in this present day in righteousness and peace and in joy. We have the opportunity to walk in the conscious presence of the Lord by walking in the Spirit. And then we see in the promise of not only His presence, but in the promise of His love. Look at verse 25 and 26. O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee, but I have known Thee, and these have known that Thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. This divine relationship that is offered to everyone who believes is fueled by love. Fueled by love. For God so loved the world. Go with me to Romans chapter number five. I want to show you the first five verses of Romans chapter number five. This promise of love that fuels this divine relationship, why we do what we do, the love that is extended to us. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Not, notice that's present. We have peace with God. We can be judicially at peace with God because our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. In other words, we're firm, we're established, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God has been shed abundantly to us. This is why, again, getting to the word of God only taps us into the love that God has given to us. It is generously saturated in our hearts. And this should overflow to those that we come in contact with. The promises of, of his love is declared by the fullness of his name. Notice what he says again there in John chapter 17. He says, and I have declared... Unto them thy name. Remember we talked about that a couple weeks ago, the names of God. He says, I have made manifest, I have made clear your name. Every name that God has, I have made clear to these followers. He says, I have declared my name and I will declare it. So that means the spirit of God that abides in us, when we look here and cry out, Abba, Father, and we read the scripture and see he is Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, you know, Jehovah Sekenu, we can see all those things in the scripture and say, that is my God. And he says, I declared it to them and I will declare it to those that come. He has declared and manifests that name clearly and he declares the promise to bring it to them. This was the first thing they had to do when they walked with him. They had to be with him. He said, come out from among them and be separate. He didn't just say, come out, come out. He said, come out and be with me. Remember, we, we've said this several times, but it says that uh, these people saw uh, um, uh, these, these followers of Christ and it says they perceived they were unlearned, but they had been with Jesus. Is your testimony that people can see that you have been with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness 
and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. What a great promise. We have a Savior that lives today. And in this high priestly prayer, remember Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. He came and declared this powerful message. He goes before the Father on our behalf. And one day he is going to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. He is everything to you and to me. And Jesus communicates his heart's desire in summary of why he came to this world to his heavenly father in this closing prayer. He prayed for himself. He prayed for the disciples that he worked with. And he prayed for all of us, future believers. We should have a powerful prayer life that patterns after our Savior. Our prayer life should be passionate, personal, and purposeful. Our prayer life should be fervent, frequent, and forthcoming. Our prayer life should be connected to God, our communion with God, and should be constant with God. One of the most neglected parts of a Christian life is their prayer life. And we have a pattern that Jesus has laid out for us. And secondly, it displays the heart's desire of God for each person who believes on Christ. Do we live in oneness and unity? Do we live in having the same mind as Christ? Do we have the same heart of God? Do we have the same vision of God? Do we have the boldness of God? And I'm praying for you and I know that our Savior is making intercession for us, that you would have boldness, that we would have oneness, we'd have unity. The prayer is only for our benefit, that we can be a greater witness, a greater testimony. And there's a promise of great peace and grace filling our lives. And I'm telling you, it begins on your knees, begging the Lord. When's the last time you begged, I mean, Beg the Lord for something. When's the last time you were so consumed in prayer you forgot what time it was? You forgot to eat. When's the last time you prayed so hard that you don't remember what you prayed about because God just took control? Can I be honest with you? I can't tell you the last time for me. I pray and I pray often, I pray fervently. But even studying this, I ask myself, when is the last time you have been so lost in prayer that you lost track of time? You lost track of everything because you were so engulfed with the Lord. The example that God has set out for us, that Jesus sent out for us in this prayer is that we should be passionate, personal, and purposeful. We should pray fervently, frequently, and be honest, be forthcoming in our life. How is our prayer life today? Because Jesus is praying for you. Remember he said that? I think we talked about that two weeks ago. He said, Peter, Satan desired to have you, to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you. Aren't you glad that your Savior prays for you? I need it. And you need it. Would you come today and fall on your face in fervent prayer for souls that need to be saved, for yourself to be, uh, the, give you the ability to be a greater evangelist in the sense of giving the gospel out, to be a, a better father, a better mother, a better servant of God, a better church member, a better person overall? I know that's what I'm going to be praying for. Would you bow your head with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I thank you.